Okay guys, so this is introductory lecture on the importance of being earnest, which is also subtitled The Trivial Comedy for Serious People, which again captures this um, oxymoronic epigrammatic style that Wilde is famous for, and hopefully by the end of this you'll have a better idea about its meaning. Um, the play itself, we have this biographical overview of um, the play's staging and its um, reception. In the summer of 1894, Wilde contracted himself to George Alexander for the play and submitted four acts. And then Charles Wyndham wanted to stage it at his Criterion Theatre. In the end, it premiered at St. James's Theatre on, on February the 14th, 1895, in three acts, and it was edited down quite heavily. It was a huge commercial success, first of all. You know, it was a, it's famous for being very, very well tailored to the clientele of that specific epoch. You know, it, it's, its subject matter is very deliberately um, targeted at um, the upper middle classes and upper classes and their uh, social conventions, and making fun of them and critiquing Victorian society as a whole by virtue of doing so. However, Wilde's trial, in the end, for indecency, he was tr put on trial and imprisoned. Because, in the end, he was sentenced and, and bankrupted. And that, in the end, intervened in his theatrical success. His name was removed from the posters, and then the, the show was forced to close after 83 performances. It wasn't then restaged until 1910 and published in 1899. The dedication in the play is to Robert Baldwin Ross, who was a close friend of Wilde's. Now, the historical background of the play is an interesting one, because the play is not hugely engaged with social issues on the surface, but the, the, the historical and cultural context of the play can give us a, a fairly well-informed reading of the text itself. It's primarily critique, and, and is largely... Uh, form without content is not actually the right phrase. It, it's, its emphasis is on harmony and structure, which is part of the, the product of, of Wilde's sort of aestheticism. Um, but it doesn't really confront head-on, explicitly, any social issues. It, it is indirectly a critique of social issues, but in a mocking, um, satirical way, rather than a kind of direct attack on them explicitly. And this, I think, is consistent with Wilde's doctrine of aestheticism. In a contemporary review in the era, the socialist playwright George Bernard Shaw actually reacted to the play's kind of what he called seeming heartlessness, you know, his, his apparent lack of a moral code or an interest in ethics or any um, moral or social issues of any importance. But it's, I think, to misunderstand the text itself, to, to, to critique it on this basis. Because the text is, first and foremost, a farce and a comedy of manners. And its main goal is to actually amuse the audience. And because of that, it, it, it's a, you're looking at the play through a, a, a sort of inappropriate, critical and thematic lens if you are looking in the play for powerful kind of social critique in the mode of, say, Pinter or even Williams, you know, this is not a play that, that directly confronts any of this content. It's also rooted much less in a specific history or place than, than many of the plays that we've seen, to a certain extent. However, I would say that the late 19th century social conventions are kind of simmering in the background of the play itself and are a huge element of its farce and satire. It contains some references to contemporary historical events, which in the end suggest a kind of troubled society underneath the glossiness of the characters that Wilde portrays. But some of the topics mentioned indicate larger political issues. And it's the, the extent of its political engagement was actually the subject of heated debate at the time it was produced. So there's no, you know, it, it is a play that rewards, I think, contextual understanding because it allows us to, to unpack some subtle features of the text itself. One of them being, one of the major issues that it, it, it sort of refers to briefly is Home Rule for Ireland. William Gladstone created controversy in 80, 1886 when he committed the Liberal Party to support Home Rule, the self-governance for Ireland, but was still within the framework of the Empire, which was a real radical shift for the party at the time. And 
it produced the contentious Home Rule, and the bill intended to pass was suppressed by the House of Lords only two years before the play was produced. What you hear, when we hear about this is when Lady Bracknell examines Jack's suitability as a part of the Gwendolyn. She actually inquires about his politics. And Jack is a liberal unionist, meaning, meaning that he is a liberal, this party of Gladstone, who doesn't support home rule. So Lady Bracknell, Bracknell in the play appears relieved, saying, oh, they count as Tories, they dine with us, you know, because the Tories were the ones who voted against this uh, independent government for uh, Ireland. And really, the only, the only reason why this matters, this sort of political distinction that Lady Bracknell um, carries out, is, is useful or important only in as much as it affects her social engagements, rather than really having to do anything um, with, you know, wild interest in the, in the issue of home rule for Ireland. You know, it's, it's interesting on the basis of what it's telling us about Lady Bracknell's kind of superficiality and her uh, the susceptibility to... Um, simplistic and surface understandings of value and identity. The distance from political concerns is, is, is important also in the play. So the only reason really for Wilde's characters in the play to get incensed about politics is if it threatens their sort of hedonistic lifestyles and the, the social hierarchy that they've grown comfortable with. And so the um, Revolution itself it sort of lingers in the background, like the French Revolution a hundred years earlier, kind of hangs over British society and, and, and did for a very, very long time. And Lady Racknell is sort of alarmed in an excessive way to hear that this imaginary Bunbury that uh, Algernon formulates as a, as a kind of an alter ego or dual character that's imagined kills him off in the story and L Lady Bracknell ex sort of explodes into hysteria herself and she says, exploded, was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr Bunbury was interested in social legislation, if so he is well punished for his morbidity so you've got this actually quite extremely cold hearted satirical representation of her character, you know, the, the, the sentiment behind her opinion is so grotesque that it seems exaggerated that he, you know He's morbid because he's interested in social justice, and he, he meets his just deserts in being killed um, for this particular interest. But her uneasiness, I think, reflects this general feeling of fear regarding social unrest in the 1890s, particularly after the working class riots in Trafalgar Square in 1885. So there's a, there is a paranoia about the disturbance of the social order. But the the word morbidity is quite an accurate description, I think, of Wilde's characters' attitudes towards politics. It's difficult for them to understand an interest in something far removed from their daily pleasures. So it's unfair, in the end, to sort of suggest that the play is a shallow universal farce with no ties to historical context. But Wilde's references to the crucial concerns of his time are usually uh, subordinated to the character's own petty concerns. Their concerns about their own lives and their sad little um, details of their, of their social engagements often take precedence, in the, well, do take precedence in the play over the historical and cultural um, context. But that's part of its meaning, the way that it subordinates those things. It's part of the satire and it's part of the farce. It shows us, exposes the sort of, the upper classes to ridicule because of their, their um, distancing of themselves from these concerns and issues. Now, Wilde's artistic philosophy is important. It's a central feature of understanding any of his writing, his belief and his conviction in, in the value of aestheticism. This famous quote from De Profundis is an important one. It says, I was a man who stood in symbolic relation to the art and culture of my age. I made art of philosophy and philosophy and art. I altered the minds of men and the colours of things. There was nothing I said or did that did not make people wonder. I took the drama, the most objective form known to art, and made it as personal a mode of expression as the lyrical sonnet. At the same time, I widened its range and enriched its characterization. He's not necessarily a man famous for his modesty. He's famous for saying, I have nothing to declare except my genius. And whether or not it's true is open to speculation, but there is obviously an element of... Um, Sort of searing confidence 
in Wilde's own sort of intellectual wit. And this quote written to Lord Alfred Douglas, who was the person with whom Wilde's intimacy ultimately led him to this kind of doomed social situation. He was actually the third son of the Marquess of Queensbury. Actually, I think it shows us the, the sense of conviction he had in his own value as an artist and as a, as a witty thinker. That's really one of the, the way in which to make sense of Wilde. The highly publicised scandal between Douglas and Wilde has actually coloured far too much his assessment as a writer and as a critical, the ability to critically understand his value objectively <coughs> as a writer and his contribution overall to literature. Wilde makes this uncompromising claim to greatness in very unlikely circumstances. At the time, he was serving a two-year prison sentence in Reading Jail, convicted of gross indecency, declared bankrupt, a man considered unfit to have custody of or even contact with his children, pilloried in the national press, and condemned by a respectable Victorian society. So we can see, ultimately, where his sort of fearsome hostility towards uh, these type, the, the repressive social norms of late Victorian England would originate from. You know, he he has a personal stake. I think in in being in the end on the receiving end of quite hostile treatment from these particular social norms. Whilst he was at Oxford between 1874 and 1878, he was looking for a set of principles. I think you know somewhere he sort of throws himself into aestheticism. I think as a way of escaping uh, social causes from which he felt alienated. I think as a, as a repressed gay man in the late 19th century, he was looking for these principles which would, could express his own passionate appreciation of objects, experiences or ideas. You know, he had a real um, interest in form and symmetry and beauty. And he was ultimately looking for an artistic philosophy that valued those things above all else. This is what he says here, it required symmetry of form, harmony and brilliance of decoration to apparently distinguish itself from commonplace, commonplace reality. And the two below especially. And this is the key thing to understand about aestheticism is that there, it is an evasive strategy by default. It's an evasive artistic philosophy that by default it is looking to provide some sort of tonic or corrective for the prosaic Victorian world of rapid industrialization with its cities begrimed and certain polluted by slums, which is one of these realities that it's seeking to provide a corrective for. And the second is the false morality which seemed uh, of, of very um, heavily policed and strongly adhered to Victorian social mores and norms. That seem to mistrust pleasure, glorified unsmiling toil for material gain as some kind of guarantee of virtue. So this sort of deeply cynical celebration of work for material gain and the value of material success as being some guarantee of virtuous behaviour, I think was a, a really crucial um, feature of, of, of what motivated aestheticism, the interest in this art for art's sake. As a young man, Wilde found that his belief in the importance of beauty as a guising principle could be enjoyed, and it could be married, sorry, with his enjoyment of material comforts and social success in the service of art. So he, you know, he, he pairs, I think, he manages to kind of formulate in his mind a combination of uh, an artistic philosophy that values this sort of objective beauty as, it, as it's termed but that also permits him to engage in the material comforts and the pleasures of a of, of, of sort of witty, upper-class social life, which is an unusual combination. You know, usually, the, the sort of zealous belief of the value of art comes with some form of um, social conscience that in the end distances the artist from the material comforts of, 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 a power, uh, of, of power, really. But in this, he wasn't really an innovator. His older contemporaries, particularly John Ruskin, who was the Slade Professor of Fine Art and the writer of many essays and articles on painting and architecture, and Walter Pater, a fellow of Bra Brasenose College, Oxford, who'd established themselves as authorities on aesthetic with the publication of aesthetics, sorry, with the publication of studies in the history of the Renaissance in 1873, this text that read the, the, the great works of the Renaissance through the lens of aestheticism. 
They'd both already preached the doctrine of art for art's sake, representing the search for beauty as a noble vocation, and, it, and in, it, in and of itself a new form of morality. So when in 1891 Wilde published Intentions, which was a collection of dialogues explaining his artistic principles, he, he, he emphasised the importance of art for art's sake, rather than as a vehicle for religious or social instruction. So he presented beauty and wit rather than naturalism or worker day morality as the artist's proper concerns. And here's the central feature of aestheticism, that it, art shouldn't be used as this means for sort of didactic moralising. It should be about form and symmetry and beauty. And that actually beauty itself is the proper concern of art rather than um, accurate representation of reality or a kind of didactic sermonizing approach or teaching educational feature of art. Using a witty mouthpiece for his own views in the dialogue The Decay of Lying, Wilde rejected the romantic reverence for nature and the Victorians' preoccupation with the practical details of their daily routine. So there's, an, you know, there's, there's a strange pair of, of artistic impulses or moral impulses that Wilde critiques in this particular dialogue where he, he, he takes on the Victorian obsession with practicality, with detail, with convention, with material power. But he also rejects the romantic kind of reverence for nature and um, as a source of artistic inspiration. So we then think of this as a, an unusual act of resistance in some ways. You know, for, for a while, nature was crude and unshaped and didn't have this kind of symmetry and beauty that he believed that art itself could have. And it's crude and unshaped and far from being the source of moral enlightenment or poetic sensibility that someone, is, you know, in a words worthy in sense would make of nature, you know, as a, as, the, as a sort of spiritual source book for uh, improving personal conduct. This is the quote from The Decay of Lying. What art really reveals to us is nature's lack of design, her curious cru crudities, her extraordinary monotony, her absolutely unfinished condition. Art is our spirited process, a gallant attempt to teach nature her proper place. This is in The Decay of Lying. Vivian, the, the spokesman in this dialogue, goes on to argue that art actually takes life as its raw material to reshape into something entirely new and keeps between herself and reality the impenetrable barrier of beautiful style decorative or ideal treatment. Now this is the central feature I think of Wilde's style is that style itself is a guarantee of separation between natural realism, between reality itself and the artist. And we can see the kind of the contextual motivations for this aesthetic belief that style somehow almost hermetically sealed you off from from reality so we see you know people searching for perhaps transcendence in various different ways and i think the style of writing itself for a while the ornamentation and its symmetry and form and its beauty was ultimately a not necessarily an escape from reality but a protective buffer against its crudity and its horror his social attitude on the other hand was ambivalent on one hand, he enjoyed the kind of personal success of the fashionable world of London's salons, restaurants and theatres and used his wealth and the way of life he found there to inspire and set off his own wit. You know, he, he really valued wit as a display of that type of mental, um, that kind of pleasing mental form and harmony itself as an art form. It's a witty dialogue in Wilde's mind was, it was just as much of an art form as, you know, effectively written theatre. And he fills his theatre, obviously, with witty dialogue. On the other hand, though, he was aware of, of its complacency and its artificiality and hypocrisy and cruelty towards those that felt threatened by it or, could not, or it could not place comfortably. So at the same time as his kind of relishing the social encounters, that, that, that um, connection with the, those of, in powerful socioeconomic positions, that the relishing of that contact and the communication and the social activity that that allowed for, at the same time is, is, is inflected, I think, by a sense of uncertainty and discomfort with its weaknesses, its complacency, and particularly its cruelty towards those that it couldn't comfortably place because he himself was one of them, and that's where his dual identity comes from. He himself, as a kind of repressed homosexual man, was one of those individuals that couldn't be placed comfortably by the 
the powerful classes in Victorian society. And so he experienced this from both angles, from the angle of, you know, the, almost the center of attention, you know, the, the, the social um, fulcrum often of this particular world and its, and its society, but then also as an outsider to this, as a, um, as someone that in the end was ostracized by those norms and, and excluded by those societies. His plays don't really hold up a mirror to nature though. They present us with elaborate and stylized vision, or revision of carefully selected images. So what we're seeing is not realism, we're not being given reality unmediated, we're being given the sort of reality as it ought to be if it were to prioritize beauty and form and wit and invention. A contemporary critic and dramatist John Ankin remarked that Wilde presented only brilliant surface and never the soul of character. I think this is a sort of misreading as well. This is a deliberate decision by Wilde and rather than an artistic failure. I think he saw the struggle to reveal human nature in, in nature in art as lending to a type of boring uniformity because he believed that what distinguishes us are the external factors such as dress, manners, appearance and voiced opinions. This man discovered through his behavior in company, not through sol solitary soul searchings or communion with nature. And this quote captures this. Art never expresses anything but itself. It has an independent life. It is not necessarily realistic in an age of realism, nor spiritual in an age of faith.